Hey guys, and welcome to another episode here on The Learning Droid. It's been a little bit of a while since I've done a video here, but that's primarily because I've been working. <laughs> I managed to get myself a job, which is great, and I've been sort of getting settled in, doing my induction, getting everything settled down. So this is me doing the patterning. It's another heat transfer pattern, uh, laser printed pattern, printed back to front flipped over and then transferred via heat, uh, keeping the hot bit moving all the time to make sure that it transfers smoothly and cleanly onto the piece of wood and to make sure that I don't scorch the wood at all. A little bit of scorching on the paper, but as long as it doesn't scorch the wood underneath, then we're fine. This one's a door sign, and I try to do a little bit of shaping later on. So as you can see, just work through the pattern slowly carefully heating up the whole thing, making sure there's a little bit of pressure, keeping the heating bit flat and level, pressed against the wood. And as you can see, nice and easy. Uh, this one's been done with the Weller bit because it's got the nice pattern heating section. Uh, the reason it's clipped on at one side is so that you can lift it up and check, and then you can, if you're missing parts of the pattern, can just drop it back down and it doesn't shift about too much. Uh, just use a standard bulldog clip to attach it at one side so that you can, bit by bit, make sure it's all in line and sort of set up. This has been sped up slightly. It does take slightly longer than this. Uh, this was about a 7-8 minute patterning. As you can tell, my hand's moving a little bit quickly for that to be normal speed. <laughs> and there you go a nice easy happy pattern. Um, the position I've been working at is uh, pretty good. I've ended up being responsible for health and safety for sort of the people within that position so quite a decent job. As you can see a standard tools, pair of pliers, screwdriver for changing the bits. You can see the wire brush and bits in the background. Wire brushes to take carbon build up off the bits as you're working with them and there's my box of assorted bits and pieces that I use while I'm burning. Different pre-shaped bits, spear points, hammered bits etc. The pri primary bit used in this build is a spear point, in this burn is a spear point bit. There we go, heat it all the way up, burn off any carbon residue that's left on it from the last time I used it cool it down and as always guys test it on a bit of scrap wood make sure you get the temperature right needed to tweak the temperature up slightly um, from this point on I'm using the Peter Child's, pe Peter Child's kit and it's a homemade spear point uh, this one's using I think 15 gauge wire it's using one of the medium gauge, wi medium gauge wires recommended for this particular kit. Now it's been a while since I've done any pyrography so a little bit shaky, a little bit unsteady. Um, I work night shifts and I work quite long shifts so I don't really get a huge opportunity to do pyrography while I'm working. I manage to nab a few spare hours. This is again sped up as well this burn in total took, um, I think it was about 50, no, it was about an hour and a half I think this burn took in total to finish. And as you can see it's sort of sped up slightly, it's still a reasonably long clip, but it's been sped up to about, um, I think it's 250% speed, something like that. Unfortunately, because I haven't been burning for a while, the, the piece I was working on dropped below the camera there. But uh, I've gone from using the edge of the spear point to using the tip of the spear point. I think I realise in a moment and bring it back up. But uh, it's been a while since I've done it and of course I had to put away my setup. So my table went away all of my tripod and things have got put away in the couple of months it's been since I did any burning so as you can imagine I had to sort of re 
set up all of the tripod and the extension rods and everything, trying to get them all set up again so that they're actually in the right place for burning and for filming it. So a little bit of a teething trouble there, a little bit of a teething trouble in getting it set up so that uh, the camera can actually see what I'm doing. When I do burn guys, because I just set up a camera and set it running because I don't have any real way of checking it because the screen's on the back of the camera, um, I just have to kind of assume <laughs> and there's me fiddling with the camera and set up and trying to get it set up into a position where I can burn comfortably and you can also see guys. So there it is, nice slow movement. I'm using the tip of the spear point and dragging backwards with the spear point. It gives a wider line and it gives a kind of V-shaped v indentation which I think looks quite nice. You need a little bit more heat when you're working with that. A little bit more heat when you're dragging, um, otherwise you'll get it sort of rising and falling in the wood. But as long as you keep it nice and stable, nice and steady. Once again, nice straight line, so you draw from shoulder to hip. You never draw towards yourself because that makes it more difficult because that's just not how our body's set up. Our body's set up sort of across a diagonal across your chest. Um, hand to opposite shoulder. So when you do your pyrography is you sort of reach across yourself and when you're doing a straight line is draw back towards your hip for the same side. And it makes it easier to keep the line nice and straight. A little bit of touching up, smooth out the edges slightly. And then back to dragging to create the nice deep V indent that I'm looking for. Uh, this one's being done on basswood, or also sometimes known as lindle wood. Um, it's a pre-done plank, it's a modeler's plank, so it comes pre-sanded and um, pre-sort of finished, but it hasn't got any chemicals placed on it, it's just pure wood. So I just cut it, cut it to size and, and um, do the pyrography pattern on it. Once again, me fiddling with the camera. <laughs> this isn't the most professional of ones, but I didn't have a huge amount of time to do it. It was a request from someone. So I just thought, OK, I'll get it done. And I set it all up. And as it was the first burn I've done since my last video, I thought I might as well film it because you've seen on this channel, you've seen pretty much every burn I've ever done. I've never sort of done a burn and not put it up. So I thought, set the camera up, get it going. Um, as I said, it all got ripped down. So I had to construct it again, put it all back together again. And it didn't come out perfect. But uh, I think this is the point where I've got the camera into the right sort of position so that you'll be able to see. I've moved on to using the edge of the pyrography, piece, uh, pyrography tip here, the edge of the spear tip. So I'm using the spear tips uh, one straight edge and I'm using it to create a slightly deeper burn on the top. I'm using the tip as the, the guide point and following the inner edge of the line. And as with all pyrography machines that are based off a um, variable current, the current isn't always exact. so. For my particular pyrography machine, at the po this point, with this wire, I'm using about a 7, about a setting of a 6 or a 7, to get this dip depth and darkness. Nice and slow, nice and steady. Don't worry about going over areas repeatedly, unless you're doing shading, in which case you, the more you go over the areas, the more you repeat going over the same area, the more depth of colour the darker it's going to get. But when you're doing bold lines and you've got the temperature set up quite high, you're burning quite deep into wood, you don't have to worry too much about going over the same area because all you're going to do is be burning a little bit deeper. It's always better to take your time, it's always better to be slow and steady. If you rush and you sort of skip off the line, it's harder to correct. So take it nice and slow. As I said, this is sped up. 
so you can imagine it's sort of <laughs> I'm moving quite slow on the video footage so I'm a bit surprised <laughs> by how slow I am moving on the video footage but as you can guess because this is two and a half times speed I'm actually moving even slower than this <laughs> my hand flashing across the screen and there's the infinity symbol guys and it's done in just the same way so still with the peer point I can't speak English today guys <laughs> I say today it is a day but it's uh, five o'clock in the morning while I'm recording this voiceover I did this burn at about sort of eight o'clock at night a couple of days ago but yes the Infinity Point's done exactly the same way guys. It got a little bit uneven but it actually smoothed out when I sanded it. And this is one of the things you'll find is if you overburn on the edges of something, as long as you don't burn too deeply on the edge of something, if you overburn, when you sand it you'll find that a lot of the overburn actually disappears. It actually smooths it out a lot. So there is a bit of forgiveness in it. Not a huge amount, but a bit of forgiveness in pyrography. And remember guys, we're all learning even grandmasters of whatever particular hobby or technique or skill even grandmasters still learn as they go along so you don't have to worry too much about making mistakes guys they happen to everybody um, this is me with a pair of pliers just tweaking it because the tip of my spear point had actually started to come separate slightly near the base which it widened out the spear point and made the angles on the edge shallower so I just squeeze it in slightly and you can do this when you're doing pyrography guys, you can just constantly be tweaking and twisting and putting things the way you need them or the way you want them. Especially if you've got a variable tip machine like this one where you can just use any when you can where you can just use homemade wire points. If you've got a machine where you have to buy the pens with the wire points in them, then changing the wire point is actually quite risky because if you damage the wire point you have to buy a whole new pen and the pens uh, with the wire points in them can go for, in the UK, it's usually about £5, uh, can go down to about 2 Now the variable tip pens like this one, they're much more expensive, they're about £30-£35, but you can buy a ream of wire, a spool of wire, for about £5, and a spool of wire will do hundreds and hundreds of bits, so you don't have to worry too much about damaging the bit you've got in the machine, because you can just make yourself a new one. Um, you can make all sorts of bits and just play about with them and I actually find that sometimes when you're actually doing pyrography being able to change a bit on the fly, change a bit while it's in the machine adjust it, twist it, change it gives you a better finish, lets you do more with your machine more with a single bit without changing pens it's one of the disadvantages of the machine I've got the Peter Charles machine is that it doesn't have a, a flick over you can chain pens together so you can have multiple pens hot at one time but certain machines have the ability to switch between two pens or switch between three pens which is more convenient for using multiple different points but really with a variable tip machine where you have the ability to twist and play with tips while you're working you don't really need to worry too much about changing pens or even changing tips as you'll see I do this whole thing with a single point with a single spear point so I do have a second pen and it does have a different tip in it um, while I was burning this one it had a spoon point in it because I thought I might do some spoon shading but thinking about the sort of request from the person who asked for this they wanted it coloured so I was thinking rather than spoon shade it I'd go with a little bit of colour shading I'd go with a little bit of shading later on when I do the ink watercolours Several pyrographers I know use, on the, on the matter of watercolouring, several pyrographers I know use watercolour felt tips, which are specifically designed watercolour felt tips. And they're quite expensive. They have a brush instead of a, a tip. And they have sort of water down ink. And it, 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 they're very, very good, but I find them to be a bit expensive. So I buy just normal water-based ink felt tips, uh, which you can get from any shop that sells pens normally, well normally from any shop that sells pens you can usually get a pack of 24 for 6-7 quid and I use a piece of glass and a little bit of water and a paintbrush and because the water's free 
the glass and the paintbrush are reusable it works out cheaper and I personally think it gives equal if not slightly better results because you're more variable with the colours you can use but I can certainly understand why people like the convenience of just having the pre-done pens where they can just colour straight off with the pen and not have to worry about mixing and twisting colours. I wasn't really happy with this bit actually. Um, this bit I'm using the edge to try and sort of set the face and I wasn't really happy because the edge was burning too hot. I made the mistake of when I adjusted the temperature to move on to this bit. Um, I cleaned the piece, I adjusted the temperature, I didn't actually check it on a piece of scrap to see what depth I was getting and what type of burn I was getting on basswood with this temperature and so it left the whiskers being very chunky and uneven a little bit dissatisfied with that but again thankfully when I sanded them they came out a little bit nicer now because I wanted a, a, the because I wanted the, the rabbit to look very furry to look very um, fluffy and bouncy rather than doing straight lines I tapped with the edge and just pressed the edge gently into the wood repeatedly uh, with the point pointing in the direction I thought, thought the fur would lie and that gave the sort of the lines a very juddery slightly furry look which I think was very beneficial to the the appearance of the rabbit again cleaning it uh, it's the one thing with myself is I like to clean the wire points very often. I have had some people say to me that they go through wire points, they go through three or four wire points on a single project, uh, wire points of the same type because the wire points stop being as effective. My answer to that is get a wire brush. Um, it does mean that occasionally you have to turn the wire tip all the way up and, and give it a scrape with a brass wire brush but in my personal opinion if you have a wire brush you can clean off the tips and actually have them working almost brand new again and again and again. So a single ream of wire that will give you several hundred tips will be a lifetime's worth of wire because even a single tip you can use repeatedly. And again just little taps with the edge of it just to give the appearance of a sort of slightly fluffed line trying to sort of pick out the idea of trying to give the idea of hairs without having to actually draw or burn in individual hairs just give the slightly fluffed line I did do a little bit of shading here just to darken the bits that were going to be underneath the bits that were going to be shaded I did straight lines on the toes and around the paws but went back to being jagged fur, fake fur lines for the legs, but I did straight lines for the paws and the toes just because I thought it looked more realistic and, well, not more realistic, it looked more what I was looking for, because I didn't feel that furry toes, <laughs> I don't know, hobbits maybe. And then I used the flat of the spear point so I tilted my hand sideways and used the flat of the spear point and used a circular motion to give a kind of fluff ball tail which comes out very well on the actual project when you see the project in person it, is very, it does look very sort of fluffed, the tail does which I think is quite good nice move back and then move on to the chest and again we just tap with the edge to give the appearance of fur. So as you can see it's a, a sort of a slow methodical process. For those of you that are interested the job's going quite well. I've settled in alright. I've still got some training to do but the induction process with the company is quite long and quite dedicated. They like to have new employees learn an awful lot and sort of take a lot of time making sure they get the knowledge done and on top of that I've been quite busy because the specific um, service, specific what they call service, so the individual part of the company, individual building that I work at is 
or was a little bit understaffed when I joined. They were looking for several different positions to be filled. And so I worked a couple of, well, worked quite a bit of overtime. I needed the money because I'd been, un as you not know, I'd been unemployed for some time. So my savings were running a little bit dry. So I needed the money, so I was doing a nice, healthy chunk of overtime just to help myself catch back up. And of course it helped the company I was joining because it meant they didn't have to bring in agency staff to fill those shifts. So I thought that was quite a uh, good deal because it worked both ways. With the Dragon, rather than using juddery lines for the edges, I did my best to use straight, smooth lines. Because, of course, a dragon's not furry. Well, according to some writers and some people, certain drag dragons can be, but for the most part, dragons are considered to be non furry. They're considered to be scaled, or some say they're leathery, pardon me. Some say they can have leathery skin. But yes, I've been enjoying the job for the most part. I've been missing the pyrography. It's a little bit addictive. It's the same as martial arts. When you stop doing martial arts f after doing it for a long time, you miss it. And um, it's almost got a little bit of addiction to itself. But it's been fun to learn all the different skills. And uh, the company I work for is quite good when it comes to not only teaching you skills that they require you to have, but also they will pay for additional education that they feel is beneficial but isn't necessarily stuff that's required. So I've actually been putting through a request to do a, a level 3 certificate that's related to my health and safety position. Hopefully now that I'm settled into the job and now that they've filled the other positions and the overtime opportunities are starting to sort of dry up, I'll have a little bit more time and I'll be getting back into doing the pyrography videos. I've had lots of people say that I say the word guys too much, so I'm going to make a conscious effort not to. I think I might have done at the beginning of this video, said a little bit too much. I'm going to be making a conscious effort to cut out the amount of times I use uh, the word guys. And I'm also going to be working on tweaking and changing the camera position to try and give you better visuals for different things. I might try very low down um, up angled camera position so that you've got almost a 45 degree angle vision of the piece that I'm working on parallel to the table so in the would that be y axis is up and down y or is up and down x up and down is y so in the y axis you've got a, a sort of a 45 degree vision so it's almost like you've got your chin on the table and you're looking at the project to try and give you a view of what the tip of the pyrography machine is doing. I'm not sure how well it'll work, but uh, it's an idea. It's a hope. <laughs> Several people have said that they would like my videos better if there was better camera camera work or if there's better uh, visuals. At the moment, guys, I'm just a hobbyist. I don't really make money off pyrography. I I mean, when I bought all of my equipment, I was unemployed, so I was buying, while I didn't cheap out on the pyrography machine, when it came to tripods and things, I basically pinched them from family members or um, for the extension rod, which I needed to get better camera positions, um, I just bought a four quid extension rod from Amazon. So I haven't got great equipment. It would be nice to have a uh, multi-jointed uh, universal direction joint camera arm that I could attach to the desk so that I could get all sorts of wonderful positions but at the moment guys I'm just working off a um, three-legged camera mount three-legged well I suppose tripods are always three-legged I was about to say three-legged tripod but I'm just working off three-legged tripod um, with just a, a two-way joint at the top an extension rod with a, a very limited angle ball joint at the top of it just to bring it out over the piece so that you don't see my hair all the time because <laughs> previous videos you used to see the back of my head an awful lot because I had to stand the tripod on the table to get it above the work 
But what I'm going to be doing, guys, is I'm going to be experimenting to try and get better camera angles. I'm going to be cutting out the cursed word. I'm still going to use it at the beginning of videos because I just will. Maybe I do it to annoy people. <laughs> no. I'll still be using it at the beginning of videos, guys. But for the most part, I will be cutting it out. <laughs> 